born the 18th of December 1990, and you know, from a very young age, even though I wasn't born in that Christian home, um, I had a lot of Christian influence in my life from, from attending Sunday school from the age of two, and then on to the Boys Brigade. I always had a real deep interest in, in Bible teachings and learning about God when, through the both, through both um, Sunday school and the Boys Brigade, and just one section of scripture that just has just stuck with me all through my life, really, and uh, coming to the point of salvation, it all come back to me. Um, it was taken from John 14, 1 to 4, where Jesus, addressing his disciples, tells us that let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. You know, just a lot in this here, but in brief, uh, Jesus never told us that we would have a, an untroubled life, but what he is telling us is that we can have an untroubled heart, even through a troubled life. Um, he spoke with great confidence about heaven, and that he was going to prepare a place for us. There's room for us all, and not just, not just a select few. Unfortunately, during this time, you know, it held no real significance to me, and I was just sort of memorizing words. And soon after, the age up to about the age of ten, I, I lost interest and eventually persuaded my mum to let me quit. I went on then and joined the, the Junior Orange a few years after that. And again, this was just sort of a, a social thing. I didn't really have much interest. It was just to get out of the house. Um, but again, with Christian influence in my life, I fell in with a, a good leader and Paul. And you know, he, sp he spent a lot of time with us, keeping us out of trouble, bringing us different places. And, and just keeping us off the streets. And sort of, again, I quit that after some time again. And this sort of stage in my life, I had opted to go hunting every Sunday instead of going to Sunday school or, or anything like that. And reaching the age of, of high school, I fell into, into boxing. And then this sort of became my, my life's focus. I was doing well. And again, it kept me out of, out of trouble and off the streets. And, it taught me a lot growing up and discipline and, and respect for others and all going well until I picked up an injury and I was unable to box or even train for some time and you know with my friends at school going out and ended up started drinking and, and getting into, into trouble um, and fighting and get on. But then as I say this had sort of fallen into a rut where my life was now focused on going out at the weekends to, to drink and stuff, really sparing no thoughts for God whatsoever. Um, as I got older, things sort of began to worsen for me. Every weekend out drinking, getting into trouble, fighting and getting on, and got into the bond scene then, and as again, no real interest in. It was just a social thing to get out of the house, and while I was still under the, in, under the, the years to drink, um, I used it to get out of the way so I could drink. Um, but the only real thing I can recall from that sort of time good in my life was meeting my, my now wife, Leanne, and sort of just sort of said I was no thoughts for God. God led Leon into my life and quickly realized that Leon's mom and dad were, were Christians, and that really became the only place I heard or thought about God in any, any shape or form at all. Uh, so Leon and I started going out, and I started going to her house different times, and I started going to church with them, and just sort of to keep keep the parent, the in -law, future in laws happy and and uh, impress them if I could. But unfortunately, going to the church with them didn't really ignite the once interest I had in, in learning about God and, and different things. Uh, if I'm honest, it had quite the opposite effect, and I ended up losing all belief in the existence of God. At all, um, but Leon and I, we continued on, and I took another go at the boxing. At, at this age, it was about 15, 16. Again, I'm doing quite well. And the same old story played out, and I got injured and uh, threw the head up. Then, and this then would really mark the point in my life where, where things would change for me properly. Things got sort of as I got older, things got worse again. I was going out. Um, 
drinking, fighting, and getting into trouble again. With my boxing experience, I suppose it gave me an unfair advantage, and I, I probably took advantage of that in the streets when I had drinking me. Even though I was quite shy when I'm, when I'm sober, but drink's an awful thing when you, when you have it in you and you're under influence. Uh, as I went on, fighting and getting on, Leon and I eventually broke up, and again, that would just spiral things out of control for me. And inevitably, one night I was talked into trying drugs for the first time. And um, what sort of began as a, as a weekend thing progressed and then a read occurrence for me. And then that was my that was my main focus. I didn't um, no time for old friends, family or Leon or God and I just sort of fell in with the wrong crowd really. <clears throat> uh quit my job, moved out of my house and ruined relationships from friends and family, some of which aren't the same to even this day. Um, I mixed up with, with current and, and ex paramilitaries. I was doing stuff that I really, really shouldn't have been doing. Even to my shame, an encounter with the, the Russian Mafia at one stage, just to give you a depth of, of where I was at one stage. Um, that then was my main priority, drugs and running after girls and criminal success thinking that was, that was my life, this is what I wanted to do, this is what I wanted to aspire to. So wrong, I got it. Again, in them situations, things got progressively worse. And over the next few months, among other things, I was involved in quite a serious car accident, leaving me in hospital for some time. Um, not, not to wise me up at this stage, continued on, and a girl that I was with one night was spiking almost died in my arms. And that just sort of really outlines the seriousness of, of things that had gone on in that stage of my life. And I just knew then that things had to change. I come back home and I got away from it all. I was able to walk away from it all, but you know, I really paid for the abuse that I put my, my mind and body through over them months. And it just sort of shows that Although there's no condemnation for us now, but there are still consequences to doing things wrong. Um, it's not a free ticket to do to sin or to, or to get in the way, the way of things. Um, over the next few months, really a few close friends, Leon and my family, on the boxing again was the only thing that got me back to normal, got my head back in order. And I began working again and just sort of got back to normality. Eventually, Leon and I would get back together, and in 2012, we got engaged. And then came along our, our first son. I have 14th of November, but it was actually the 10th of November he was born. Uh, so, and again, Leon and I engaged. I had to start going to church with her mum and dad, just, just so the minister would marry us, really. And it was Bolly McGurney, Free Presbyterian. And with Jack being there with us, didn't again ignite any any once interest again in God and I would hope that Jack cried so I could bring him out to the car and get out of there. At least I made the effort to go, which was my thoughts. I hated just being there and you know, it tells us in Roman eight, Romans eight, verse seven, that the mind governed by flesh is hostile to God, does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. And I hated even being present in the Lord's house. So while Leon and I were in the stages of Wedding planning. Ian here, as you know, he was he was my best man, and he came down one night. We thought to discuss about the wedding for for his dinner one night, and he announced that he got saved. So we may see him now that I, he I sort of made jokes and made fun of him, but in the back of my mind, I couldn't work out why. The few wee wonderings of what if, what's what's going on, why did he do that, and um, so. Leon and I then were married in August 2014. And again, this sort of marked a point where the outlook on, the whole outlook on life would change. And I believe to now that this is the, when the process of conviction first started for me. Um, I had a new awareness of sin. I seen things differently. I stopped swearing where, where I used to just swear all the time. And, but I didn't know. I had no teaching. I didn't know what, I was, what was going on. And I, at some points, I didn't really pay any attention to it. 
Um, but again, I was wondering, and Leanne and I were speaking one day, and we were speaking about Ian, and I said that I would maybe go to church with him someday. I was thinking about it, and she gave me the oddest look I've ever seen in my life. Um, sort of said she don't even believe in God, and I just, just smiled and went on until a few weeks later we were down in Ian's house and sort of similar conversation come up and I, I said the same thing to him and I got the same look again but it was for me in this time and Lilian she backed me up and Ian rubbed his wee hands together and he said no ball any time <laughs> <coughs> so he had him going to Arma Island at that stage and I went with him the next Sunday night and the first night I went in was an odd experience, to be honest. It was never like any other church I'd ever been to. It was totally different to anything I'd ever experienced. No one was in suits, no one had their ties on, and I was thinking, what's going on here? Um, but I just got a sense of everyone feeling it being so welcome, and everyone being a family or friends, and I just couldn't put my finger on it, what it was. But I really wanted to go back the next week, and I said to Ian, I went back that next week. And from the thinking about it all week and going in the second the second week, the second night that I walked in there, I just knew something was different. First step I took in there and as the, the worship began, I just felt the full rush of believe now conviction what just of everything I'd ever done. Just how awful I was and how awful I'd done and how I'd hurt people in my life and I just couldn't I could hardly control myself from crying in front of everybody in this place that I'd only ever been in once before in my life. And there was a guest pastor in that night. He was Paul Hudson from the missions director. And he was speaking, and, and what he was speaking about, I just felt it speak directly to my heart. I had been had questions, I had wonderings that I'd been asking a, a colleague in work that was also a Christian, and he was leading leading my dancers and there was Paul that night just giving the same answers to the same questions that I've been speaking, that I've been thinking about. And I wondered, I couldn't, couldn't get over what was going on. Paul made an appeal to go up and for anyone that would want to go up and be prayed for. And it was, it was a real battle on inside me. I just, I wanted to go up, I wanted to step out in faith, but the flesh just held me back and I, I, still, I missed my opportunity then. And... After the service was finished, still, still head racked, trying to think of what happened to me, and I found myself talking to the pastor there that night, and started sort of explaining of what, what I'd been feeling and what I'd been thinking about that night, and he had asked that I wanted to go in and have a wee, a wee chat with him, and I've sort of a, I have a hard time saying no to people, so I said yes, even though I didn't really know what he wanted to go in and chat about, and he asked if he mind, did I mind if he didn't come in with me, so... Ian and I went in with Pastor Mark and I could share in more detail of how I'd been feeling up to the coming time and Mark started explaining a few things. It was it really brought things into perspective and he just hit me with a question then and he asked if I want to give my life to the Lord and again the negative thoughts and the flesh just riled up and says, no, she, you don't even know what you're talking about. You don't know nothing about it and you can't get saved, you don't, you don't know what you're talking about, you've only been here twice, what do people think? But it's not about what you know, it's not about what, what you understand about it, it is taking that step, of, that leap of faith. And I said no, but he asked, could he pray? And during the prayer, I just felt something inside me saying, just do it, just do it, just do it, just do it, over and over and over and over again. And he hit me with a question again, and I accepted, and I, I prayed, and... I asked God and um, Jesus into my heart and I was the 31st of August. I surrendered to God's call and, and asked him to be my Lord and Saviour. Uh, so it didn't solve all my problems. My head was still racked for the coming week and sort of trying to get the grips what was coming on and inside me and, and what had happened. And I found a couple of verses that just really helped me just come to grips with it. The Bible tells us that if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. That old things have passed away and all things have become new. And it also tells us that we are to be renewed by the transformation of our minds. And again, that really just helped me 
grasp the whole, or come to terms with the whole process that had been and gone on with inside me. And now a new creation in Christ. Over that week when things started to sink in, um, I just couldn't stop singing. The only song I knew was Amazing Grace. Uh, I just couldn't stop singing it over and over again. I was driving anywhere or going anywhere on my own. I just couldn't help thinking of how lost I was, how blind I was. But now I praise God and I'm now found and I thank him for saving a wretch like me. Um, as I say, things don't just disappear, problems don't disappear and things don't just get easy when, when you get saved. Uh, within my first month, I got my first, hit my first conflict with, at a boxing event with old friends when I, I met up with them and uh, I was offered, I was ridiculed, I was made fun of and I was even offered drinking drugs, tempted repeatedly with them. Um, but again, the Holy Spirit was with me and I had no, no problems down in declaring my decision in my, my new life and, and standing up for what I, I believed. And again, sort of things sinking in and, and just sort of looking back on, on what God had brought me from and the things I'd done. It was in my human mind I thought I needed to repay God in some way. I thought I needed to do something and I began rushing to different things and got involved quickly in a couple of ministries and I went everywhere and anywhere I could really. Um, soon quickly learned that you know, things, some things aren't God led and it is just of ourselves and it's not really about what we can do but rather it's what, what he has already done and now I've been saved just over a year during this time I've been I've been very blessed and I've experienced the move of God in so many ways. The Lord, he shared with me a burden for the lost and I've been very fortunate to be able to share my faith with my family, my friends and work colleagues, seeing some success along the way. I'm now involved in the food bank in my, in my church and I'm able to assist in providing help to people in need and, and just to, to share the love of Christ and hoping, that they, hoping and praying that they see that through us and you bring about them divine appointments that we would see people come to know the Saviour. Uh, still make mistakes and do things you shouldn't do, but just thank God that he has new mercies for me every day and we can be sure that his grace goes beyond any of our failures. God continues to, to lay things in my heart and, and to challenge me in different ways. And even just as I was preparing for this here, I was led and my heart just reflecting back on my, on my previous life as an unbeliever. And I'd just like to share that. Just as I, as I reflect back on my previous life as an unbeliever, I would, uh, I'd oftentimes got a, a wonderings of what if, questions what if in my head. And I don't know if there's anyone in here tonight that can relate to this here, but... Questions like, what if God's real? What if what the Bible says is true? And what if that still small voice inside is God speaking to you? I can now tell you that them what ifs are the biggest realities that you'll ever face. Them what ifs are the biggest certainties there has been or there will ever be. There is a God and he loves you with an immeasurable love to the extent that he died for you. Seek him while he may be found and put your trust in him and I promise you won't be disappointed. I just want to thank you for, for having me and, and listening to my story. That's me. It's always wonderful to hear of how God is still working, especially in young men and women, but the young men's lives where they get so low takes Christ alone to be able to lift them and then them saying it's Christ and just um, for five minutes or so I just picked up on something that, that Ben had said he mentioned the scripture in John 14 and I'm not going to bring a big word tonight it's just a little thought just as he said it in John chapter 14 and listen to what he says listen to what it says I should say he quoted some of it let not your heart be troubled you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. The Lord Jesus said these 
these words when he was going to ascend to heaven. And he's saying, where I'm going to be, if you want to be there, then you must follow me. The wonderful thing about this testimony is, is that as, as Ben was speaking about where he had been and what he had done, this scripture, he says, has really stuck with him throughout all the years of him growing up through BB Sunday School or wherever he was at, and, and it's, ing it's ingrained in him. And, and then he comes to a place where he says he just doesn't believe anymore. God isn't real to him anymore. And sometimes unbelief and even the wiles of the devil can make us think that there is no God. The fool has said in their heart there is no God, and we all become foolish. And at one point in time, Ben gets to the place where there's no God in his mind and his heart. He says there is no God and he won't believe, he can't believe that there's a God until, of course, God does step in. But doesn't it show you how no matter uh, uh, how hard we try in religious circles, it's the word of God that's within us. It's the word of God that's in our hearts. It's the word of God that's preached and taught. It's the word of God into your children at this time. I think of our Sunday schools and I think of Kingdom Kids and the youth and, and I think of, of those children who are told the things of the Lord when they're sitting at home by their parents and, and those things you might think that they're, they're not a lot in it, there's not a lot to be done with it. Well, why do we bother so much? But when you see someone like Ben, even though he went even worse and he thought there is no God and he becomes uh, with atheistic views, uh, really the word of God was in him all the time. And at the right time, God brought that word to fruition. At that time, God used it. God spoke into him again, and that word started to generate a faith. And, and he might think, you know, well, I went here and I went there, and I went to church with my future in-laws, and I went to church with, with Ian and so on. But at the end of the day, it was God using those people to bring him to a place to where he had to find exactly who he is before Christ, that he's lost. In other words, when we look at Romans chapter 3, in Romans chapter 3, this is what Paul tells us in verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Notice, not one of us are righteous, none. It doesn't matter who we are, what we do, what we think, how hard we try. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no not one and what paul is saying look, look at the word way here because in john 14 and verse 6 jesus says to them i am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me and jesus didn't say i am a way or i am a way of many way of a few or one way among many he says i am the one only an exclusive way to the father and outside of me there is no other way early followers of Christ before they were first called Christians in Antioch as we read in the book of Acts were called followers of the way that was their name that was given to them because Christ was the way to glory Christ was the way to salvation Christ was the way to the father Christ was the way to heaven the only way the unique way there is no other way and when a man and a woman look for another way think of another way try another way their ways are not ways at all in fact in the book of Romans chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, they are all gone out of the way. They're all gone out of the way. And every one of us who are outside of Christ, or when we were outside of Christ, were out of the way. We were outside of Christ. We were lost. We were destitute. We were depraved in our own nature. We were unable to help ourselves, save ourselves, forgive ourselves. In fact, we were in our sin to such a degree and to such an extent that there was no way that we could ever get to heaven because we were out of the way. But when Christ comes into a life and he looks at a young man like Ben and he sees Ben and he says, Ben saying he doesn't believe in me and it's a foolish notion for the man of said or the fool of said in his heart there is no God. And when he says there is no God, it's a foolish notion. But nevertheless, the word of God was which, that which was working in Ben, lying dormant as it were, but starting to bear root and to it'll branch out to grow, bear and grow fruit. And here, whenever he hears the word, the spirit touches, life comes. So whenever a man and a woman, whether it's in here or outside, wherever they are, if they're not saved, if you're not in Christ, you're not you're trusting in his finished work on the cross, if you're not washed under the blood of the Lamb, you're out of the way, as Romans chapter 3 and verse 12 says. They are all gone out of the way. They are, to get, they are 
together become unprofitable. There's none doeth good, no, not one. In other words, our good works are as filthy rags before God. Everything we haunt him, everything we offer him, everything we try for him, everything we hope for him, every single bit of it, every single part of it, every day of it, it's like filthy rags before the Lord because we are out of the way. We are unprofitable servants before God. And even God gives us a description of the man and woman who are out of the way and outside of Christ. It says in verse 13 of Romans chapter 3, their throat is an open sepulchre. Can you imagine a dead body that's been lying rotting in the Middle Eastern heat of the day in the sun? Um, it's rotting away. Maybe it's a family tomb. It's a family grave where families have allowed one another to go into eternity without knowing Christ. And here there's an open sepulchre, the stench, the stink, the, 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 the degrading and the, the, the decomposition of bodies that, that will be oozing out when the wind blows past and will draw out the stink and the stench. And he says, that's what their mouth is like. That's what a man and a woman's breath is like unto God when they're outside of Christ. We're told Saul went about breathing, slaughterings and threatenings to the church of God until Christ came into his life, his mouth was as an open sepulcher. Until Christ came into his life and the light shone and he fell to the ground. And he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he says, who art thy Lord? And he says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Oh, the risen Christ speaks to Saul, changes his name to Paul, and he no longer has an open sepulchre for a mouth. He no longer breathes out threatenings and slaughterings against the children of God, but he now joins them by becoming born again through the Spirit of God. And he starts to, as it were, carry the fresh breath of the gospel to many that would listen and many that would hear. Their throat is an apple, open sepulchre. Their tongues... With their tongues they have the seat, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Isn't that what you said, Ben? Your mouth was full of cursing. His mouth was full of cursing and swearing and full of bitterness. It was like the poison of asps. It was something that was very dreadful before God. And just as I'm sitting there, these scriptures came to me. Just as I'm sitting there, I'm saying, Ben, I see it because I was there myself. I was among the number at one time myself. His uncle Ian was there among the number at one time himself. And, and it was Ian who brings him uh, uh, to, to church that night and he hears the word of God and he surrenders his life to Christ. And, and he was there. He now is a torch serving to light another because he brings Ben. And you could be a torch serving to light another if you come to Christ, if you don't know him, and if you are in Christ, then bring another to church. Bring them under the sound of the word. Go and witness to them at their home, at your workplace, wherever they may be, for you are a torch for Christ, serve to light another. Here is the change of way. If any man be in Christ, that's what Ben says. He says that he read this scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Now, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Yes, the, the very unprofitableness that Ben was living in, that I was living in, that all of us outside of the way of Christ were living in has passed away and all has become new. The whole of that unprofitableness has now changed to becoming profitable. There's none that doeth good. We do good, not because our works are good, but because Christ is good and because the goodness of Christ is in us and we do good to glorify him. We are in the way, not out of the way when we are in Christ. Our throat is no longer an open sepulchre, but our throat is no longer, as it were, a sepulchre full of dead men's bones, as Christ once said. But our throat, our cells, our bodies, our temples of the living, go the living God, the, the temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. And we have a new song put in our mouth, even praises unto our God. And as the psalmist says, many shall see it and shall fear and shall trust in the Lord. Yes, there's no longer... Under his tongue there is their deceit, but no longer the poison of asps and cursing under with his lips, and his, sweet, his feet are no longer swift to shed blood. I don't know about in the ring, but that's out of the ring anyway, Ben. Swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are their way. Notice that. This, Paul says destruction and misery are their way. Those who are out of the way, destruction and misery are their way. 
See, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, and we'll stand before Christ, and we'll give an account of our lives, and we'll stand before the Father, because he will ask not what we did, or he'll not ask what we have done, and he'll not ask how many cigarettes we smoked, or how many pints of beer we have drank, or whatever trouble we have got into. He'll just look at our very carnal, at the prey of nature, and, and that is enough for him to cast us to hell. No matter how good a life it is, well, I never drank, I never smoked, I never done this, I never done that, and I never fornicated, I never ran around, and I was a good person but no matter the goodness of the man and the woman in our very nature we have sin and the father will say what did you do with my son what did you do with him I gave the very bosom of my heart for you I give you my son he hung he bled and he died on a cross for you what did you do with my son have you received him as your savior and as then we'll know are we in the way or are we out of the way if we're out of the way then in verse 16, we're told destruction or misery will be our ways. And the way of peace, they have not known. Jesus said in John 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. We have peace with God when we're in Christ and in the way. We have the peace of God as we learn to yield to God and the peace of God as we learn to fellowship with Christ. And if there's one in here, I don't know as all, but if there's one in here and you're not saved, you're not right, are you out of the way? Ben was out of the way. But now he's in the way. Praise God, Ben, for the grace of God that came into his life and saved him, gloriously saved him. Wonderful testimony, Ben. Absolutely tremendous to be able to stand and tell how the Lord has come in and saved you from uh, such a depraved uh, way that you fell, such deadness of heart, such a, uh, a atheistic thoughts of there is no God, a foolishness that comes to, to brute ignorance is what it means whenever we look at it in the real context of brute animal ignorance where an animal has no thought of God. Men become like brute animals, brute beasts where there's no thought of God. But when the Holy Ghost comes in, he convicts a young man and a young woman and he speaks to their heart. And the word that he hears that day and something that sticks with him, it sticks to his soul as it were. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's no other way. No other way save through Christ alone. If you don't know him, you're out of the way. And the Bible says nothing but destruction and misery is for the lost soul and sinner. Hell bound forever and ever. Bands heaven bound forever and ever because of Christ and Christ alone. Brian, God bless you. We really enjoyed that testimony. Stirred my heart, made me think of myself and some of the things I've done in my own lifestyle.